So hi, everybody. Last part of our um, night hacking interview series today at Develop Week here in Nuremberg. Um, my guest actually is uh, Jennifer Marsman um, from uh, Microsoft. And we are talking about a non-technical stuff. That's innovation. Oh. So far. Oh, let's let's see. <laughs> let's see where we get. Um, actually, everybody talks about innovation and wants to be innovative somehow. But what is innovation for you? What do you think? Uh, in my opinion, innovation is something that you take some pieces and are able to put something together in a new way that I hate to word the, use the word uh, disrupts because that's such an overloaded term right now, but to, to disrupt in an uh, in industry. Um, I think about things that, uh, you know, and it's usually not, you know, one person by themselves, but it's people building on ideas or putting ideas together in a new way that can cause uh, a pretty neat innovation. Um, I think about things like... Um, like Uber, like I, Uber isn't that popular in Germany, I don't think. So maybe that's not a good example. No, oh, that's perfect. Is it? Okay. So uh, just just the idea that I, I believe I read an article that it, it was born when um, he couldn't get a taxi cab and thought there's got to be a better way, and then kind of came up with this idea from that. So a little bit of the, what is it? The necessity is the mother of invention, right? And so I, I think that's that's a, a part of it is just when you um, when there's a need and you're able to think of just a, a different way of attacking that need that hasn't really been, been done before, that's, that's innovation. Mm -hmm. um, actually, that, that's, but why, why actually innovation is then so important? Is, is it important? Well, not if you want everything to be like it has been forever and ever, but I think progress can be good. Uh, it can be bad as well, but it can be good. Um, I, I know that uh, with every major change, there's always scary elements as well. Um, when we think about the Industrial Revolution and the idea that machines were automating some of what humans were doing before, like that was terrifying at that time, right? Because people uh, who had been doing things by hand now had machines and assembly lines to make that a little easier. And so um, the idea of, um, of being able to, to you know, lo or having, losing your job potentially, it was scary. And I think we're seeing the same thing right now with the rise of machine learning and artificial intelligence where a lot of people are, you know, have that same fear that they're going to lose their, their jobs or be displaced. Or even, even cloud computing, I see some of that of, okay, if it's off in this other data center, if my data isn't with me, you know, am, I, am I still relevant and that sort of thing. And so, I mean, the way I look at it is when you have some of these things that can automate for you and get some of these things done for you, then that frees up your time to do hopefully more impactful things uh, that, you know, that aren't being automated. So um, thinking about new ways to, you know, uh, run your business and the stuff that really is the, the secret sauce that helps um, drive businesses forward. And if I just would ignore and say I don't need to be innovative at all, is that, would that be dangerous? There's a lot of companies doing that. That's <laughs> so true. You can. Uh, um, it's possible. Uh, but, I mean, I think progress can be good. It can be scary, but it can, it can be good. It can be bad as well. But, yeah, there, I mean, if, if, we, if no one ever innovated again, like, that's, that's terrifying, right? That would be a horrible world. Would you want to live in that world? Like, I wouldn't. Is, I, is that realistic, that no innovation happens at all? I don't think. I don't think it is either. I think it's it's good when people um, make new connections and are able to put things together in different ways. And if that makes um, if it makes one thing easier to do, then that frees up opportunities to work on other things. So I, I think progress progress is is usually in general a positive thing. Yeah. So I guess it was also a good, a good example to see where, for example, with the iPhone, that was definitely an area where it seems uh, other companies were innovating faster than even your company, uh, Microsoft at the time. So I guess you learned from that uh, episode or experience? I hope we did. I hope, I hope there's always learning. So I, I think one of the things that, that Apple is very good at 
is um, the idea in innovation that you're not necessarily coming up with something new, but, but you're putting things together in a different way. So when you look at something like um, FaceTime, what, what they did with FaceTime, honestly, it was a, it was a forward-facing camera, right? It wasn't, it wasn't anything that was that innovative, but it was packaged so beautifully, and they told such a compelling story and had these television commercials of you know, a soldier away at war mm -hmm. and being able to look through the thing and actually see his daughter taking her first steps. And that, that's a very emotional um, message that resonates so well. And, and so really, it, it's just very impactful marketing, the way they, they're able to, to take that and take a concept that, you know, it's a, a forward-facing camera, front and back-facing cameras, right? But uh, you, be able to use that to tell a new story. So I, I would argue that that is innovation, just the way that you're, you're able to take something that already existed, but, but twist it a little to make it, uh, make it new and different and exciting. Yeah. Can I, are there options that I can simply somehow create innovation in a company? I just say, I take 10, I, oh, I shouldn't. You start for talking, that's better. <laughs> it, um, is there a possibility that uh, I just can simply create consciously innovation in a company? Just say, give me 10 people, I give budget, and they should go in some dark room for two years and come out with innovation? So I think going in a dark room for two years is a bad idea in general, um, just because uh, things change so fast. And if you have a two-year-long milestone, <laughs> that, uh, uh, that's probably not going to work very well, especially with the, the rate of innovation should hopefully be a little faster than that, or more, a more agile methodology may be, may be more effective. But I think a lot of companies are struggling with that, and they've come up with different ways to, to, to attack that problem. Um, I know at... Um, at Microsoft and at a lot of other companies, um, we set aside dedicated time for hacking. And so like we have um, this one week hackathon where uh, every year set aside a, a week to do kind of your own project. And I know um, a lot of companies have like a, you know, a 20% um, a project. We, we've done those at Microsoft as well, where you, you spend a certain percentage of your time on just free projects that are interesting to you personally. And then I think a lot of times, again, it's born out of a specific need. So I see something in my job that I think I could do more effectively. So let me build something to help make it better. Or let me, um, there's a problem that I think maybe we could try something different. And so some of these things I think are born out of you know, very specific needs. Or you, you see a problem and just by get, being granted um, a little bit of time and kind of a blessing from your manager to like just, okay, you have this time that's for you, for your own kind of growth and learning and such. Um, just having that gift of time can make an enormous impact on innovation and the amount that you're able to innovate just because you feel uh, motivated or uh, encouraged um, to have that time to do well. And I think the other thing is um, when you do want to encourage uh, innovation in a company, you need to be, have a culture that's okay with failure. You know, you need to be able to, you know, what was it, the little thing that they say about Thomas Edison that he uh, figured out, a, you know, a thousand and one ways not to invent a light bulb before he actually got the light bulb working. Those types of things. So if you do have that time, you do have to celebrate um, failures as well because I think a lot of times uh, within companies we tend to, you know, trumpet our successes and here's what I did right and here's this exciting thing that I accomplished. Um, but if more people talked about their failures and... Um, lessons learned, essentially. So I, I tried to tackle this problem, and here were the things that stopped me. And so I found this workaround, but I still haven't figured out this problem. And just sharing more of that, because I think people don't, are, you know, aren't as comfortable sharing their failures. And so because of that, we don't uh, necessarily, you know, other people just make the same mistakes when they're going through the same learning process. And if we shared that more openly, then you could learn from someone else's less, you know, what they've already done to, you know, be able to take a step forward a little faster. Could, uh, do there also be, let's say, organizational hurdles that, that make that kind of process or culture change much more difficult to have an idea? Um, about budgeting processes, for example, that make it different, that collaboration is much harder to do. Actually. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, different companies have looked at that different ways. There are companies that have funded you know, innovation labs where they're supposed to, you know, go innovate and, and have their own thing. And I think 
um, a lot of ways the those teams operate is by kind of going and talking to different groups and finding out what their biggest issues are and what are the problems that they need to solve and then finding out what are the commonalities between all those uh, issues and if there's a problem that's happening in multiple disparate groups over and over again, then that seems like a good thing to tackle first. And then if they can innovate and try to come up with a solution for that, which then can be shared by all those teams, then, you know, the, that kind of lifts everyone up. So um, that's, I mean, that's one way that it's been approached. But I agree, it's very challenging. Um, the idea of setting aside time when, when you have, you know, goals and deadlines and that sort of thing, setting aside focused time to innovate is, is crazy to a lot of companies. And so... You really have to, um, you know, understand the data around it. I mean, a lot of times the, the whole reason some of what Agile caught on is when the data started circulating that, you know, failing fast, you know, if you find the problem uh, this, you know, sooner at this point, it costs you this much time and money. And then if you find it this far, much further down the road, and th those were the arguments for like test-driven development and things like that, and why we kind of saw a, a big rise of testing and such, um, just because people you know, got that data and that data started to be widely circulated that catching these things earlier is going to save you so much time and money in the end. And so I think it's the same thing with innovation. If we had some concrete data and numbers that we can share with people that, hey, you know, these people, you know, with this set aside innovation time, were able to come up with these other things um, that, you know, that ended up being used. So um, one example we have right now, like the bot framework at Microsoft, that was somebody's innovation project, essentially. That was someone saying, hey, I think I could do this thing, and then sitting down and doing it, and then that became a product. Um, I think Gmail worked the same way at Google. It was somebody who sat down and wrote it, you know? Yeah, I'm not sure if it was uh, a full-time project or how many years uh, they actually spent in a dark room, but after all, that's also how Java started. Uh, and speaking of Java, uh, you probably heard that James Gosling uh, recently joined one of Azure's uh, biggest competitors, Amazon Web Services. Uh, what do you think about that? Um, I, I don't really have any, <laughs> any strong thoughts about that. Uh, I think in general, um, innovation is good. And um, there's a lot of great minds in the industry. And um, I think all of the, the big companies you see um, a lot of people, I work in the machine learning and, and uh, big data and artificial intelligence space, and I know, you know, Amazon has been doing work there, and I know uh, there's some people on my specific team that have jumped back and forth between Amazon and Microsoft a couple times, uh, because we're both, Google before. Yeah, yeah, Google as well, yeah, there's, I mean, there's, there's so many companies that are doing things, and honestly, this, this exchange of information and these, you know, great minds moving around will, will hopefully, you know, um, help us all work together better, right? If I, I have a lot of friends at Google and Amazon and the other large companies as well, and uh, when we're all kind of working together, we can, you know, share more information, and I think it, it, it works better. And I, I think you see that a lot in terms of, um, like, all that Microsoft has been doing in the open source community now. Like, I know uh, there's probably been a lot of, you know, press and hype about, you know, Satya, but I, I can personally say that uh, the, the culture change... Uh, with, with Satya is, is real, like he passionately believes in the open source community and meeting people where they are and that sort of thing. And so I think that takes really two major forms. Um, you see us uh, kind of sharing and releasing some of what, what we have built. So um, for example, you know, the .NET framework being open source and that sort of thing. Uh, but then secondly, we're going to major, you know, open source projects that we don't own. So instead of, you know, there's kind of the, taking something we own and sharing it, but then taking something that's basically community owned and then contributing to that in a large way. And one example of that is um, in the Hadoop ecosystem. Mm -hmm. uh, Microsoft has you know, all of these uh, amazing PhDs uh, in SQL Server group that are just insane at database optimization. It can just do some crazy performance tricks. And they went and uh, were actually able to contribute some stuff back to um, to some of the, the products within the, the Hadoop ecosystem and uh, made incredible performance gains. And then all of that was, was checked back into the main hub and like just you know created this amazing uh, uh, performance in, improvement. So um, it, it's really cool to, I mean, 20 years ago, you wouldn't have thought of Microsoft essentially giving away really uh, valuable intellectual property that was part of what made SQL Server so compelling. Um, but it's it's happening now, and it's really amazing to be part of the company. Like when it's in the middle of that that change. 
Actually, actually, Microsoft is not alone doing such things. IBM, um, for example, it's another example, a couple of years ago, um, uh, was also uh, stopping his internal initiatives of internet in big data space and was uh, contributing actively and doing stuff then in the Apache group as well. That was the start of all that big data stuff that is now in the Apache group there. Yeah, it's great. It's, it's great it's, to see people it, contributing. It's it's great. There are different reasons why they did that. One of the reasons is also complexity. They simply said, we we need more good brains working on that stuff because it's so complex. And what I definitely can agree that Microsoft, when I compare how they they were dealing a, a couple of years ago, uh, it's not the same company anymore. Definitely not. Um, what I was... Uh, another point is... Um, about the source of innovation. We now talked about much about uh, um, community or more also innovation um, source internally by some teams in dark rooms or whatever. Um, do you also have innovation coming from your end users? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I, th I think innovation can, co can definitely come from end users and so uh, that's why, like feedback, having a feedback loop with your users is so important and such a such a strong thing that I think a lot of you know um, uh, companies really focus on, and, and it shows. And so when you when you do take that that input from your users, I mean those are the most important people that are using your product day in and day out. And um, you know the developer is not the user and never has been. And so being able to think about it from the perspective of oh this is my typical workflow. And maybe the developer wasn't thinking about that, or you know, I use it in conjunction with this product a lot, and so then, oh, maybe an add-in or some way to tie those two things together would be useful. So, absolutely, I think innovation can definitely come from from users. Um, let's let's a bit focus on that bad word disruption. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's take an example that is Kodak. Kodak a few years ago was one of the biggest uh, company in, 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 in photography, actually. And they started actually with, with digital photography. A couple of years later, they were gone. Do you remember what, what was happening there? What was, what was going wrong, actually? Because actually, they, they, they did, they were innovative. They started with all the stuff, but at the end, it was their end. And the kind of the story there is, that it's not enough to be innovative. You have to have you have actually a, a sustainable support for continuing with that stuff. And one of the issues there is that often at the beginning it doesn't count financially to be innovative. Mm -hmm. So you nevertheless have to be because it can add badly. Actually, mm -hmm. do, do you know other examples? I just ask. But that's yeah. the one I know well. Yeah. No, Kodak is a great example. Um, let me think. Uh, other examples that innovated, I mean, uh, um, Netflix is a huge one, um, just in terms of renting videos and how that disrupted the, that industry. Um, and I know, uh, you know, the, the idea of like going to a, a store to, or a video rental store uh, now seems, uh, seems so old fashioned. And really. Is Blockbuster still there? Does it still exist? Barely, I think they're they're hanging. I, I don't know if they're hanging in there or not, but um, but I, I know I I'm I love Netflix. I am a huge user, and so I think I think that's another example where you know they f they figured out a sustainable business model. Um, they you know they they had the infrastructure to make it happen and the fast turnaround time in terms of like you you know first when they were mailing the CDs out at the beginning, um, but they they you know got it to you within two days or whatever it was. And so they, they figured out an infrastructure and made that happen and then were able to continue it. But they also continued innovating and then, okay, let's stream things now and let's, you know, so they, they kind of kept pace with what was going on in the industry. So, um, I mean, Netflix is an absolutely huge example of, of uh, disrupting an industry and how they were able to uh, make things happen. And I think, um, you know, Amazon has done a similar things in terms of just um, online retail, just being such a, the, the first really, really, really successful uh, store that didn't have a, a, you know, a brick and mortar equivalent. They were just online, but you could get everything there at a fairly decent price. And, and I mean, they, they're, that's amazing. They did a very good job in terms of shopping as well. And then thinking about things like um, prime and special benefits and things like that to help, to help people even more. So, no, I think there's a lot of great examples out yeah. there. Well, I... 
don't have anything more much to add. Time is over as well. Do you have some last words for the audience? No, just keep innovating. <laughs> well, yeah, by the way, great keynote in the in the morning uh, with the lie detector. Uh, were you ever thinking of uh, offering that nice uh, new shiny headset to some people in the White House and read their thoughts, or do you are you afraid there would be too many false negatives or false positives? <laughs> Um, I, yeah, I'm not even going to touch that one. <laughs> I don't, I don't, a lady does not discuss politics in public, but oh my goodness. Uh, the, we'll, we'll talk after the cameras are off. <laughs> okay, let, let's take these words. And uh, thank you, Jennifer, for joining us. And turn the cameras off, please. All right. <laughs> thank you.